I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, June 23rd, 2022. Today, we're bringing you an episode of our Arbiters of Truth series on the online information ecosystem. In fact, we're rebroadcasting an episode we recorded in November 2020 about disinformation and the 2020 election. We'll return with a new episode next week, but for now, we thought it was worth taking a moment to look back. If you've been watching the hearings convened by the House Select Committee on January 6th, you've seen a great deal about how the Trump campaign generated and spread falsehoods about supposed election fraud in 2020. As the committee has argued, those falsehoods were crucial in generating the political energy that culminated in the explosion of the January 6th insurrection. What shape did those lies take, and how did social media platforms attempt to deal with them at the time? In late November 2020, After Joe Biden cemented his victory as the next president, but while the Trump campaign was still pushing out its claims of election fraud online and in court, Evelyn Duick and I spoke with Alex Stamos, the director of the Stanford Internet Observatory. Our conversation then was a great overview of the state of election security and the difficulty of countering false claims around the integrity of the vote. We think it's worth a listen today, as the January 6th committee reminds us what the political and media environment was like in the aftermath of the election, and how the Trump campaign committed to election lies that still echo all too loudly. And though it's a year and a half later, the problems we're discussing here certainly haven't gone away. It's the Lawfare Podcast, June 23rd. A rebroadcast, the most intense online disinformation event in American history. Alex, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, You are well on your way to the prestigious and totally existent Arbiters of Truth five-timers jacket, and uh, we're very thrilled to have you back. I'm looking forward to that. Is that green, like the master jacket, or (laughs) what color are you guys picking for the felt? That is exactly what I have in my head, and, and also in reality, not just in my head, for sure, definitely a real thing. So last time we talked, uh, it was around the launch of the Election Integrity Partnership, the coalition of researchers that you helped found in advance of the election that was focused on working with researchers, government and platforms to deal with disinformation in real time during the election. So we had the election. Um, Maybe we can start really big picture. How did the election go? How much disinformation was there? What were the general themes? What did you see? So, you know, there's, there's upsides and downsides, right? So I'll talk about the things that worked out well. So One of the things that worked out well is that we saw very little in the way of foreign interference this time. That was clearly an area that everybody was concerned about coming out of 2016 uh, and the couple of different uh, influence operations that were were run by the Russians, especially during the election. And uh, a good thing is we've seen very little of that this time around. You know, there's still going to be, I'm sure, some investigations of what was behind certain news stories uh, that broke in the run-up to the election. But when it comes to kind of the straight-up creation and amplification of disinformation, we saw very little of that. And I think that that is due to the creation of dedicated teams inside of the big companies, as well as dedicated task force in the government working together to find and shut down these actors in the run-up to the election, including, you know, kind of defending forward activity uh, by NSA and Cyber Command. So that was good. We saw very little what we'd call maybe bot activity or what people generally call bots, not a lot of automated amplification of content. Um, I think that's another area that companies have done a lot of investment in over the last four years is on detecting low quality accounts and automated accounts. Definitely though, a lot of disinformation. And like I said, somewhere else, this is probably by far the most intense disinformation event in American history online, at least. And the vast majority of that came from and was amplified by big influencers. And that's the big difference this year is you've got people who we know exactly who they are, where we know they are Americans, and yet they are the conduit or the amplifier of disinformation in a way that is very different than this year than in previous cycles. In September 2019, I edited a piece that you wrote for Lawfare sketching out a nightmare scenario of sorts for 2020. You sort of imagined an election that was total chaos. There was dueling hack and leak operations by Russia and China. There were denial of service attacks on 
communication systems. There was a hack of voting machines. There were Russian troll farms pumping out disinformation. And this all led to this kind of nightmare scenario where the outcome of the vote is contested. As you kind of hinted there, obviously the president is contesting the outcome of the vote and right wing media is to some extent backing him. But there's no real doubt about the fact that Joe Biden won and that he'll take office in January. So Again, a high-level question. Why didn't that worst-case scenario happen? Is it that our systems are more robust uh, than they might have been? Uh, Were the concerns you voiced sort of overblown? Did we get lucky? Is there a shoe left to drop? What do you think? You know, so first off, that piece was never meant to be like a realistic scenario, right? The, The point was I included kind of all of the bad things that possibly could happen. And I think it was never realistic that all of them would happen at once. Uh, but you know, I still feel that any of the individual actions were possible. You know, one of the big things that didn't happen is we didn't have direct attacks against election infrastructure. And I, I think that is due that the efforts since 2016 and since 2018 in this area have been very effective. And a lot of the credit there needs to be given to CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is a new agency that was stood up right after the 2018 midterms that took over for a part of DHS that, as the director says, uh, sounds like a Soviet-era spy agency, the NPPD, and became kind of the premier defensive cybersecurity agency in the United States, they were responsible for securing election infrastructure. Um, Although they were very limited in some of their capabilities because elections, uh, as everybody who listens to this know, are run by states and local officials. And so you have this you know, a ton of people making up their own security uh, standards, buying different kinds of products, running their own infrastructure. And CISA does not have the ability to order them to do anything, but they were very effective of building services and then building trust with the local and state officials. And I think that had a positive impact. I think also, though, the reason why you didn't have direct attacks against election infrastructures, you know, in the piece we talked about, the goal of those attacks would be to create chaos that would then open the door for the results being uh, fought over. And instead of hacks against election systems, what we had was COVID. Uh, and you know that the massive changes that had to be made to support uh, voting in this scenario already created kind of pre-hacked the election in a number of people's minds um, and created the possibility of all these claims. And so, you know, I, I don't think, you know, in, in that we talked about the possibility of some of these legal fights actually going somewhere. It seems that it's unlikely that President Trump's appeals are going to be effective, but it's still, I think, interesting to say that, you know, the prediction of people, of this being an election where, where Trump was not going to concede uh, and that there's going to be a significant portion of people who thought the election was stolen. I think that is actually turning out to be true. The path that we got there turned out to be different. So the Washington Post uh, reported a story by Ellen Nakashima that touches on some of the, the same points you made there and suggests that, as you say, that foreign interference may have been limited in part by sort of U.S. action, sort of helping keeping interference at bay, but that part of it also is just that Americans are, you know, pumping out enough disinformation themselves, like the call is sort of coming from inside the house. Um, Are we now in a situation where we can sort of definitively say that for this election, domestic disinformation is more of a problem than foreign disinformation? Is it more that sort of, as you kind of hint, foreign actors can just sort of sit back and watch everyone run around in chaos? Like what, how do you read what's going on? Yeah, no, I mean, I think absolutely it's true to say that domestic disinformation uh, was in this cycle and probably will be for a number of cycles the biggest problem here. When it comes to the foreign side, one of the things I think is interesting is that you know, while CISA and the local and state officials did a really good job, there were still remaining vulnerabilities, right? And a number of people kind of quietly talked about bugs being patched, devices being connected to the internet that should not be connected and such. And a lot of that stuff was was cleaned up, but I'm guessing that there were still systems that were vulnerable. And there's still a question of why did no adversaries attack those those systems? You know, one of the possibilities here too is that I'm not totally sure Russia catching the car was exactly what they wanted in 2016. That, you know, there's clearly a goal of some of these influence operations is to amplify the importance of Russia in the eyes of the world. But that's something that certainly you can kind of overshoot on. And it's pretty clear that via 
kind of the defending forward that we've seen, the intrusions into the offensive networks of our adversaries that has been done by by Cyber Command. And then these, you know, one of the things that wasn't talked a lot about outside of the cybersecurity world, but we've had a, a huge uptick in the public disclosure of significant uh, intrusions by a combination of FBI, CISA, and NSA's new cybersecurity directorate. And I think those two things combined probably convinced adversaries that while they could attack election infrastructure and maybe get some short-term benefit, that there's effectively no way they'd get away with it, right? That if, if you're reading these things that make it clear that your command and control infrastructure has been broken into, that perhaps some of your communication mechanisms out to your various agents have been tapped, then there's no way that in your calculation you can say we're going to get away with this. So you, you, the outcome of messing with the U.S. election has to be worth the possible downside of dealing with a Biden administration who has hard evidence that you were behind that operation. And I'm guessing that just kind of in a rational self-interest calculation, that was not worthwhile for a number of these countries. Okay, so let's pivot to talking about the domestic disinformation then. We originally sort of wanted to have you on after the EIP had written up its final report of all of its findings and activities, and we kind of nixed that plan because, well, the EIP is still going, and partly because we seem to be settling into this post-election period where there's still a lot of disinformation uh, bubbling around, a lot of domestic, and there seems to be partly that it's kind of settling in to large parts of the populace. Or at least that sort of seems to be the external impression or the external narrative. First of all, is that partly what you're seeing? What What's happening in this post-election period? Yeah, so what we've seen since the election is a consolidation into a small number of narratives focused on specific swing states. So, you know, one of our observations was that there was kind of a, a bunch of spaghetti thrown at the wall on election day and in the couple of days after the election when it wasn't clear where the critical states were. And the disinformation ended up following the map on CNN or Fox News. So if, you know, for example, one of the big themes that we're going to talk about in our final report, I should note that, you know, I'm going to be a little bit careful here because I don't want to scoop all of my partners. You know, there are four institutions involved here. Our group at the Stanford Internet Observatory, the University of Washington Center for an Informed Public, Graphica, and the Atlantic Council DFR Lab. And we're working on a collective report that will come out in early January on this. And one of the narratives we'll be talking about that is this idea of Sharpie Gate, of um, this narrative that specific voters were given writing instruments that would not register appropriately. And actually, the first mentions of those happened on election day, did not get a lot of amplification, although we saw it in real time and ended up with tickets with them that allowed us to trace this back, where we had somebody who was legitimately asking, hey, I'm, I'm voting with a Sharpie and it's bleeding through. Is that going to be a problem? The answer is no. The, the people who make these ballot machines know that ink can bleed through. And so if you look at a ballot, there's not circles on the exact same spot on the back end, on the back side as on the front side, right? So when, if it bleeds through, it doesn't actually affect anything. Um, and then another person asking about pencils, that you know people are not used to voting with pencil. It feels a little weird because somebody could erase your your circle. It turns out, one, the pencil would work fine with those scanning machines. That was a COVID response in that in that specific precinct. They did not have uh, pens that they wanted people to reuse, so they're giving out those little like golf pencils. And so those questions were asked by people, I think legitimately, on election day, and then were picked up. And I think one of those was in Illinois, which is you know s s clearly not a swing state. And then they were applied to the swing states as different states became critical. And so we saw a huge focus on Pennsylvania day of, because everybody knew Pennsylvania was going to be critical. And so we had a lot of disinformation about Pennsylvania. But then when Arizona turned out to be super critical, when Fox News called Arizona for Biden, and that became very controversial, within minutes, we saw a switch of the disinformation to be about Arizona and a recycling of the Sharpie gate questions from other states in Arizona. And so you, you see this very interesting thing where you know, this disinformation is not, this is not like a natural progression. This is not up to the grassroots. These are clearly people who are injecting this specifically for the goal of driving the idea that the election was stolen and they're doing so, you know, around the, the states that are being fought over. And so since the election, what, what's happened is all that spaghetti thrown against the wall, most of it has fallen off and there's a couple of pieces of spaghetti left. And so they've they've narrowed down to a couple of different narratives and then those narratives get hit over and over again, not just online, but on Fox News, especially Fox News primetime. And then by these large influencers who have very big audiences and the ability to convince those audiences to spread the message themselves over and over again. And so now, you know, we're talking about like three or four narratives, like the big one is Dominion Voting Systems, which is a company that makes the, the voting machines in Georgia, as well as the counting software. 
I, I, we don't have to go into the details, but as you can imagine, there's a bunch of really crazy technical claims being made about Dominion that are just not true and a bunch of claims that are not technically possible. The other thing that's happening in Georgia is there's a hand recount going on. So basically all those claims are pretty much neutralized. But anyway, like the Dominion and some other kind of narratives. And so we've only got two or three things that are now being focused on and hit over and over again um, with very little change. And that seems to be tied to the states where there still are legal challenges going on. Did the fact that the vote counting process was so drawn out give extra space or extra oxygen to disinformation and misinformation? I know, you know, we've heard for months that it might take a while to count the votes because of mail-in ballots and largely Republican state legislatures that didn't allow states to begin counting mail-in ballots that arrived early ahead of time. And there's plenty of reporting out there about how President Trump sort of planned to use that to spin up theories and all that kind of thing. Some of this is obviously driven by Trump. Some of it is a sort of a, a fertile environment. Do you think that the situation would be any better if uh, Election Day had been, you know, one day and it's over process? Yes. <laughs> the, the extended right. vote period has absolutely contributed to this. It has created it created a space for people to start to make these narratives form. Now, even if we got the results on election night and they were official results, there'd still be disinformation, right? I think what, what happened, especially this time, is the delay in counts and the blue shift, which was predicted by many, many political scientists, that you could have uh, the Republican candidate doing better on election day and then the Democrat doing better as the mail-in ballots are counted. That is something that we've seen in the last several cycles, it was not at all surprising, but that blue shift was extended out in time, both by COVID and the, the shift of people to voting by mail and by various absentee mechanisms, but also by the intentional decision, especially by the legislature in Pennsylvania, which is controlled by the Republican Party, to not allow the Secretary of State to start processing ballots as they came in. And so, yeah, I think that absolutely created the opportunity for this and has made the situation much worse. So you said that you're seeing the disinformation coalesce around a couple of key narratives. And I'm sort of interested to get your thoughts on how we should think about this going forward. And maybe to make the, the question concrete, we can talk about a now somewhat infamous example of the Stop the Steal Facebook groups that popped up in the days following the election. So these were groups centered around false claims that the election results were being manipulated against President Trump and that the vote counts needed to stop. And some of these groups were some of the fastest growing groups in Facebook's history history. Um, one amassed over uh, 320,000 users. At one point, it was gaining 100 new members every 10 seconds. Um, and there was sort of a lot of concern and outcry about these groups that were founded around this false narrative. Uh, and eventually, it was shut down by Facebook, citing uh, some sort of exceptional measures and the fact that there, in the end, had been signs of calling for violence. And I just want to sort of linger on that nature of the exceptional measures and, and the calls for violence and, and how we should think about these groups and this kind of narrative going forward, because it seems to be like it's it's not going away, and how we should think about those groups and these this kind of disinformation as it settles in. Yeah. So first off, you know, it's something I've talked about, and I think on, on this podcast before, is, you know, I continue to believe that the that there is a trade-off between privacy and safety here. And, and when we talk about safety, when disinformation, it's a very broad definition of safety, right? In that, you know, if you are using a part of the product that does not give you a lot of amplification, if you're speaking to a small number of people, that uh, the rules should be looser, right? If, if you have a phone call or a text message, you expect more privacy and definitely probably demand less censorship than you would expect of somebody who has a live stream of 2 million people. The Facebook groups are, are this product that's fascinating because you can't determine whether a group is going to be more like a private family conversation or more like a broadcast medium up front. It has to happen dynamically. And that's what happened here. And that, that Facebook group was a private group, right? So you, you couldn't just see the content in it. You had to be applied to be accepted into it. And then they had to allow you into the group. And you know, generally, Facebook has standards that are you know, lower for those and it makes and it is harder to take those down because of that kind of trade-off between 
privacy, free expression, and amplification. But as you talked about, these groups got very large very quickly. Um, and I wouldn't be shocked if that is the largest, like truly private group in Facebook history. Uh, but you know, I, I don't have that that data. And so I, I I think, you know, there's no good line here. It would be nice to have more transparency. I think in these situations, you want to have kind of a quantitative metric of if there's a certain amount of content that violates certain rules, then you automatically shut a group down. Those rules are clearly much stricter around things like child safety, where the number of violations you get is sometimes only numbers one uh, versus something like disinformation. But those rules do exist. And in a situation where you see a group that is so large that is effectively a public platform now, I think it's appropriate to take action against it because it's pretty clear that that group was was created specifically to get around the labeling and takedowns that were happening on public pages. So it's a great example of why these rules can't be completely static and determined ahead of time because we are talking about adversarial action. You come up with rules around disinformation to make it not spread as much. And so people find product affordances or parts of your product that give them the same application, but that they know the rules are different. One of the big stories of this post-election period seems to be the rise of alternative social media sites like Rumble or uh, a site called either Parler or Parlay, depending on how you pronounce it. We sort of see conservatives and people on the right dissatisfied with measures that the major platforms have taken in response to disinformation, decamping to these alternative sites that ostensibly offer more free speech. So how big has the movement from your perspective? And do you think it's it's going to be a permanent feature of the new information environment? Uh, is it something that will sort of, you know, revert to the mean in a couple months? And also, I'm curious, like, what challenges you think it creates in this space? Yeah, I, I do think this is going to be permanent. Uh, you know, we've seen this in other countries, right? So the United States is a bit of a lagging indicator in that there's a number of other countries in which you will have kind of the large normie internet site that everybody uses, which is often Facebook. And then you will have uh, smaller sites in which the rules are different or not enforced at all that end up being the home of some really problematic groups or content. And so I, I think, you know, the U.S. is just following in those footsteps. And in those countries, it does create all kinds of interesting problems in that you create a space in which you can have a sub community that really self radicalizes because there's no outside voices in it. And in this case, you know, anybody can sign up for Parler. You have to give up a lot of information. Uh, so it is much more privacy violating than any of the big platforms. Uh, in fact, to get a verified, they have a, a, a kind of verification that's necessary, a bunch of features that they want you to send a photo of your ID in, which is uh, pretty aggressive. And so while anybody can join, they are shutting down the accounts of liberals despite their free speech mantra. They are. Uh, making some very political editorial judgments of who's allowed and not allowed to be on the platform. And so as a result, you're going to end up with a community that doesn't have any kind of outside ideas injected in or criticism of those ideas. And that will be able to radicalize those people. And then you will probably have those folks going out and trying to recruit people into it. And you know the the community that this is a lot like is Akun formerly 8chan and the variety of the other Chan sites, uh, which have played a very significant role in white supremacist circles and in the incitement to violence. And the most horrible example of that would be the, the shooting in Christchurch, where the group was organized on 8chan and was communicating on 8chan. And 8chan is where the shooter was getting you know, these ideas and getting support. But then when he wanted to reach a larger audience, he jumped onto Facebook just for that one thing. And, and that creates a, a real challenge for these big companies because you end up with an account that perhaps has existed, has done a little bit of stuff. You have no history of it. You don't have a, any kind of karma scores or the kind of mathematical models that you might have of a user and their, their likelihood to do something bad. And then all of a sudden they do something like a live stream that is really, really harmful. And none of that data exists for you because it's on another platform. How they handle it is going to be a really interesting question. And, and it's going to interact with the antitrust issue because, you know, one of the options you have here is if one of these sites gets really, really bad and a significant portion of the content is violating of your policies that you effectively blockade the entire site. That's something I recommended in my testimony uh, to the House uh, Homeland Security Committee a little while ago, specifically talking around these white supremacist sites, that it would be appropriate for the big companies to block them. But it's different to block some white supremacist site that's run out of Russia or the Philippines versus a 
10 million user social network that is owned by Rebecca Mercer, uh, who has very good lawyers, that is going to be seen as an antitrust issue. Uh, and so it's it's fascinating that like all of these tech regulation issues are all coming to a head at the same time, right before we have a new administration and new Congress. So let's talk a little bit about what caused this not mass exodus, but you know, somewhat exodus, and and why these people felt so aggrieved. So the actions that the I don't know, do we call them mainstream platforms took? So what did you see from the mainstream platforms during the election, encountering misinformation? What were the sort of key differences between the approaches that they took, and uh, did they work? Yeah, so that turns out to be a really complicated question. We have a, a big analysis of the policies the companies took into the election. Uh, so folks go to eipartnership.net, they can click on policy analysis. Uh, and we had a whole team that spent a ton of time trying to figure out what these companies' election policies are. It turns out that that's really hard because they don't write them all down in one place. And if you look at our like uh, citations of where we pulled this, in some cases, we're, we're citing the tweets of employees. In some cases, it's blog posts or, or newsroom posts. So, you know, that that is like one basic issue is the companies are not doing a very good job of documenting in one place what all their policies are. Those policies were significantly different. I think, you know, to super generalize both in a policy perspective and then in an enforcement perspective, I would say Twitter was the most aggressive. Facebook was in the middle and then of the big companies, YouTube was by far the least aggressive and the least effective. And that specific difference between them, that was a big one, was how their labeling worked, right? So, on Twitter, they had two levels of label. One where they just say, effectively, this content is disputed. The text of that label changed depending on exactly what it was and what time it was. Of be- They changed the text of the label before um, the AP called it for Biden and afterwards. But effectively, it's like, this is disputed, but they allowed people to reshare the tweet and to interact with the tweet normally. And then they had a more aggressive label that you had to click through to get to it, and that turned off retweets. Um, and that is a you know a pretty aggressive move, uh, but one that I think is appropriate in the situation where people are injecting straight up, absolutely known disinformation that is not at all in the Overton window that is completely factually incorrect. And they did use that. Facebook, for the most part, would take down content that uh, was about you know confusing people how to vote and the like, and so a bunch of that stuff just disappeared. But on the claims that the election was stolen. They had a number of different labels. Again, they changed the language a bunch of different times, but none of them were as effective because they did not have the same kind of limits that Twitter had. That being said, they did pretty aggressively apply those labels. There is a new story saying that there's an internal Facebook study uh, of the effectiveness and that this was not that effective. I can't verify that, but that feels like it's probably accurate that this did not reduce the spread of these stories very much. If you look at CrowdTingle data for the week, some of the the most uh, popular posts were from Donald Trump, uh, specifically saying it was stolen, you know, all of his posts about that. And then YouTube was, I I would say, the least effective. Uh, One, their label was really very, very milquetoast. But the other issue with YouTube is the way people consume content, which is it is a, you know, 100% video site. And so, you know, like I was talking about, one of the big problems in this cycle is the big influencers, the people with these large followings. And on YouTube, those people are effectively primetime cable hosts. And so you have somebody who might be talking for hours in a live stream that is then chunked up and that you can see parts of it later. And that multiple hour stream will have this little label that doesn't even show up in a bunch of different types of the product use. It doesn't show up if you do a full screen and such. And it's it's already kind of milk toast and like here's a link to, you know, some voter information. And I think that was by far the least effective. Um, And it raises a really interesting question of, in these situations, what is a Facebook Live or a YouTube? Because some of these people have like millions of people watching their show, which is larger than like the daytime viewership of CNN during normal times. And that's also another interesting dynamic is lots of people are watching TV on election day, maybe the day after. But the further we get from the election, the more important social media gets because the ratio starts to reestablish where the number of people interacting with this content on social media is larger than they're interacting with on TV. And so, you know, in a situation where YouTube is carrying these people and then also paying them money, it makes them much more like a cable network uh, than what we would normally call a platform. And I, I think YouTube has a lot of work to do here if they don't want it, the same thing to happen in 2022, 2024. So I just want to say that in the lead up 
to and, and around the election, the EIP and the work that you guys were doing was a, a really big source of optimism for me because watching the sort of impact that a relatively small group of smart, motivated and strategic people could have was was pretty inspiring. And things like the, the policy analysis that you mentioned uh, was so incredibly useful. I mean, it's kind of crazy to think that like a group of independent researchers needed to do that, to collect these policies from places like individual tweets and blog posts and Facebook posts and things. But but this is where we are. And and so it was a necessary job and you guys filled it. And I think it was really uh, effective in in putting pressure on platforms to fill the loopholes and the gaps that, that you guys identified, except for as of course, and as you mentioned several times, um, YouTube, which just seem to not want to engage in in that process at all. So thank you for for all of that work. And I'm just sort of I'm wondering like have you guys uh you know struck yourself with the curse of success? Like from the outside it seems like you filled a really important need in this space and you did uh really valuable work. Do we have to make it permanent or does does this space need something permanent like that and is that sustainable? Yeah, I, this is a great question. Actually, something we're thinking a lot about for the report, the the chapter about how the EIP worked, but also what we learned about the space is one that I'm supposed to write the first draft of. Uh, and that's one of the things that I am pushing off by being on this podcast with you. So I do appreciate you uh, helping me out with my uh, delay there. We're honored. Yes, thank you. <laughs> this is way better than playing Xbox with my kids. Well, I'm actually uh, thinking we should round this up now. Um, and you no, need to get back to work, Alex. This sounds important. <laughs> appreciate that. Yeah, I, I do. There's a real interesting question of like, who is in charge of protecting societies from disinformation? And when it comes to foreign disinformation, it's already pretty complicated. Uh, although there's a lot more consistency that Politically, there's not a lot of people arguing that you should allow foreign governments to significantly affect your political sphere. And so the kind of activities by FBI, CISA, NSA, Cyber Command in those areas are have a broad base of support and a lot of authorization in law. When the content is domestic, then it raises some really difficult questions. And you know, the companies themselves had very large teams in some cases doing this work, but they're very focused on themselves, right? And if Facebook finds some disinformation, they're not going to go notify YouTube or Twitter. In fact, uh, there are some arguments that ECBA and SCA make that difficult, as well as a variety of privacy laws. And so, uh, and the other issue is that they're not going to give you any transparency, right? There's there's a lot of content that was taken down before we saw it, and nobody's ever going to see that, right? We're never going to know what those people said. We're never going to be able to get the statistics on that. Um, and so that was one of our goals was not just to act on this stuff in real time, but was to archive it so that we could have a good empirical report afterwards of what actually happened. And, you know, even in this case where elections are a very specific event, there is an agency, CISA, that is you know, directly responsible for coordinating the cybersecurity side. There was nobody in the government who could do any coordination of the disinformation side. And that's not only because of the current White House and the fact that they would not want to fight domestic disinformation. That is a problem that is going to exist for the Biden administration. And I'm, I'm not sure what the great answer is because you know, this isn't just about elections. And something that we are really concerned about is vaccine disinformation. And I think that's what the big fight is going to be in 2021, both domestic and foreign disinformation focused on the variety of different vaccines that are coming out. And that is going to be something that cuts across political lines because kind of the existing sets of people who are skeptical of vaccines already include a bunch of different demographic groups that don't vote the same way and aren't lined up from a political perspective. And, and so you're going to end up with domestic disinformation that is motivated for people's like personal beliefs and religious beliefs. You're going to end up with uh, possibly domestic disinformation that is professional, that is trying to make things hard for the Biden administration. And you're going to have foreign disinformation that is about promoting their solution and downgrading the solution from other countries. And when you mix it all together and you ask like, well, whose job it is to pay attention to that, to study it, to talk about it, there's really nobody in the government that seems clearly positioned to do so. And that opens up this interesting question, like, does the FDA have to have its own counter disinformation team that sits there and looks at Twitter all day and has a bunch of the kind of software that we built to find this stuff? I don't think that's a realistic thing. So either we're going to have to have continued partnerships in the academic and private sector that work with the right government agencies, or we're going to have to build some kind of function in the government that can support all of these different agencies in their work. 
I'm tempted to suggest a whole of government approach, but <laughs> I'm not actually going to do that. Right. Um, right. We should have a whole of government <laughs> Public private partnership. Exactly. Hand exactly. Coming together, a thousand points of light. Yes. Exactly. Um, in all seriousness, though, because something like that sounds wonderful, but isn't going to happen. In your view, like, are there particular realistic models that we might expect the government to play here going forward, or that we might be able to take action, whether through legal reforms or some kind of restructuring or something like that? for government to play? Or are we just going to be sort of stuck with this weird mishmash set up until, you know, the whole of government approach magically comes through? Yeah. So I would say, I think the, on the offensive side, they already have the authorizations they need to go after foreign groups. And that's great. I hope that continues. On the this defensive side for disinformation, I think one of the changes that would be nice is would be for a number of agencies to have authorization to at least study the problem. There was a RFP that was put out by CISA in the run-up to the election where they effectively had to ask for somebody to custom build a dashboard of what was going on on Twitter that removed any of the indication of whether somebody was an American or not, of, of who their identity was, um, because their current authorization effectively doesn't allow them to even look for disinformation on Twitter, even if they don't take any action on it. And so I think rules that allow government agencies to build those functions internally, where they know what's going on, they know who's behind it, they know what's being said, as long as you have guidelines that they're not allowed to censor that, right? That they're not allowed to go to Twitter and say, you would definitely have to take this down, but that they can at least understand what's going on, that that's critical. Because even if you're not taking down content or labeling it, one of the core things that happened that we were really proud to be part of via CISA and the EII SAC was counter messaging by the various authorities that were involved. You know, a great example of that is there was a guy in Erie, Pennsylvania, who did a Instagram story like a 19 or 20 year old kind of joking around. Uh, I was just a poll worker and I was burning all of the Trump ballots. So this Instagram story pops up, somebody screenshots it, sends it to a big Twitter personality. All of a sudden that their tweet of that screenshot gets like a hundred thousand interactions and goes wild with people retweeting all over the place. The guy has to shut down his Instagram account and hide and everything. And so we spot that we reached out via our government partners to the people in Erie, Pennsylvania, which would have been very difficult for us to do on election day if we didn't have a pre-existing mechanism. They were able to verify that nobody of this name had ever volunteered or worked and that the thing he was claiming of just being able to figure out who the Trump ballots were and burning them is completely impossible. They put out an official statement. We were able to send the official statement with the disinformation to the companies, the companies took it down. And so that kind of counter messaging should be able to happen only within the government, right? If during, while the vaccines are being distributed, if somebody is pushing the idea in one specific religious community that this vaccine is unsafe, I don't think the FDA should be able to go take that content down. But what they should be able to do is come up with counter messaging that they target directly at those people. And that's also what I'd like to see these companies do is provide counter messaging in a much more effective way via their ad platforms. The most powerful tool at these companies is their ad tools because that's what makes all the money. So that's where all the really smart people work on. And if somebody is, you know, I, I think like the kind of thing that I would love to see them do is if you have something go viral in one specific community that you could have the FDA say, okay, I would like to show an ad to every single person who either saw that or clicked on it or reshared that content. And then counter message, this is why the vaccine is actually safe. Um, and that's the kind of partnership I think you exist, but you have to have the authorization of the government to just study the issue. And that doesn't exist right now. Um, and again, I, probably not in all these agencies, probably you end up somewhere in DHS or somewhere else with the capability to have a war room that operates in the same way our team worked that has pre-existing data relationships and all of the data analytics code that you need that then can support different agencies in doing that work. So Let's talk a little bit more about industry collaboration. It's something that we've talked about here on the podcast before, about how it can be really, really important to the effective countering of, of disinformation when companies share uh, signals and intelligence, particularly on the foreign disinformation stuff. And we have these press releases from these companies every so often saying, yes, we're definitely talking to each other and, and monitoring this stuff together. And it's really useful and great, but without a lot of detail. And it's sort of billed as one of the big improvements in the industry since 2016, that this kind of collaboration and cooperation is happening. Um, I'm interested to know 
if that's what you saw, um, you talked a little bit about how that's not necessarily always, the, the interests aren't always aligned and also how far it extends. So last time you were on the podcast, we were talking about how Nextdoor and TikTok are also, you know, vectors for disinformation and important platforms that we should be watching. Are they sort of all in on this collaboration? And is the trend going to be towards more of that going forward? I mean, as we sit here and speak now, there's a hearing uh, in the in, in the Senate with tech platforms, and some of the senators are expressing concerns about platform collaboration as some sort of, you know, collaborative censorship model. And so I'm just curious, what you've seen and what you think the trend is here. Yeah, I mean, I think there is somewhat of a trend to work together. The big countervailing force here is there's still significant incentive set up to not be transparent. The truth is, is that companies that come out and say, we have a problem and here's our data about it, end up with bad stories about them and end up getting grilled in front of Congress. And then there's some companies, I'm not going to name any of them, but you might want to, who just hide on this, right? Who never publish the stuff they find, who secretly and quietly take care of problems, and they end up avoiding it. The best example of this was uh, around child safety issues. Uh, last year, there's actually quite a, a very good series of articles in the New York Times. I believe they just won a, a journalism award about child safety online. And this is an area for which, you know, unlike disinformation, there's no real political arguments. This is the kind of thing everybody agrees should be stopped. But for the first time ever, because of those articles, we got a glimpse into the child safety world. And this is where there is more collaboration between the companies, but it is still really uneven. And one of the things the New York Times uncovered is that around 90% of the reports of child sexual abuse material sent to NCMEC, which is the coordinating group on this issue, are sent by Facebook. And so the result of that was not kind of a, a people asking intelligent questions of why that is. What you have was a hearing in which Mark Zuckerberg gets yelled at because the senators interpreted that as 90% of the child abuse happens on Facebook. That's not what that means. What that means is that Facebook is the only company that's actually looking really aggressively and other companies are much less aggressive. And so as long as we have this kind of model where if you are proactive, if you look for bad stuff, and if you talk about it publicly, you will be punished for it, then you're not going to have in either collaboration, nor are you going to have what we need, which is the smaller companies trying to deal with these problems proactively instead of reactively. And I think, you know, there's a lot of talk about Section 230 legislation and such. And I think of all the pieces of legislation, my favorite right now is the PACT Act. And that one of the big focus areas is transparency and, and mandated transparency, not just optional. And I think one of the things I'd, I'd love to see out of the companies is first them to collaborate on a taxonomy of the bad things that happen online that they can all agree with that then allow them to publish statistics both on what they do but then also what the the existing prevalence the remaining prevalence is what they estimate right um the companies have numbers on what they take down but they also generate prevalence numbers of what they're missing by doing things like having a human being go look at 10,000 randomly selected pieces of content and those are the kinds of numbers the companies do not like to share and i'd like to see that kind of stuff be required so that you if everybody has to talk about what they're doing, you're going to end up with it no longer being a motivator to not be public. And you'll end up with the ability to have at least some public pressure on these really horrible things. That's the other thing I think everybody needs to remember. Right now we're talking about disinformation, which is the most politically difficult area where there's the least kind of societal agreement on what you do with it, which was reflected in the Senate hearing today. But there's a bunch of really horrible things that happen every single day online over which reasonable people will never disagree on. That's where we should start. And if we could get those areas all to a level of collaboration that is above where we are on child safety right now, I think that would be a huge accomplishment and is a totally reasonable goal of any of this legislation while you know, kind of punting for a little bit the really difficult First Amendment issues and free expression issues around political speech. Yeah, I'm bullish on the PACT Act as well, actually. Of the 20-something uh, Section 230 bills that are currently floating around the Hill, uh, that's that's my favourite as well. So one of the questions that's being asked in this moment is, you know, what's going to happen? So the platforms took all of these exceptional measures, measures that were unimaginable, unimagined in 2016. And I think sort of 
really only sort of came on the table uh, in the last few months around things like labels and even, you know, deamplification measures and introducing friction uh, in a way that we've never seen before. And the question I think people are asking is like, was the election, the disinformation Super Bowl, a big opportunity to make up for 2016 and, and prove that, they're, that they've learned and we're sort of going to revert towards the mean now? Or is this like a one-way ratchet uh, that we're going to see increasingly not just around sort of big ticket events, but also just sort of more generally as part of our online information environment. Do you have a sense or a sort of normative preference for what you think uh, should happen here? So I, I think what's likely to happen is that things have changed permanently for the small subset of disinformation issues where the claims are generally falsifiable and are easily falsified, right? So the vast majority of political disinformation and influence operations are making claims that are generally not the kinds of things you can fact check, right? When you look at Russian activity in 2016, which we keep on pivoting back, but like the, the internet research agency content, the vast majority of it was not making any actual factual claims that you could say is true or not. It was radical political positions that are extreme, but within kind of the Overton window of what we allow in political debate in the United States. And so election disinformation, where you're saying, this is how you vote, this is how you, sh you should vote, you shouldn't vote because of violence, the election was stolen. Those are claims that are falsifiable and for which there are a reasonable set of experts that you can rely upon to give you the right information. COVID disinformation is also the same kind of thing, although the challenge there is the reality of what is the current expert consensus changes all of the time. So if Facebook had been using uh, the World Health Organization as the standard by which they would take down COVID disinformation, then they would have taken down every single post where somebody was saying, I think you should wear masks in March because back then who was telling people not to wear masks? But in these situations where there's like a consensus of where the expertise lies, I think things have changed. I think one of the big areas of fight over the next couple of years of an area that is adjacent to these, but not as easy is going to be climate change, right? In that there is probably as much evidence for anthropogenic global warming as there is of masks help you against COVID. But it is an area that is very tied up in the discussion of solutions and the political impacts of that. And so it's a much harder area to go and say what is disinformation versus not. But I think that is going to be the next fight. Um, but I, I do think in these areas like elections and COVID, things have changed permanently in the United States. The big question for the companies is, are they going to provide the same kind of election protection around the world? There's something like 80 to 100, you know, quote unquote, important elections every year around the world. They're not going to be able to do what they did for the US for all 100, but they could do it for the three or four that are highest risk. And what I'd like them to do is to talk about how they're going to pick those, those ones that are highest risk, because right now their risk measurement is based upon their own uh, regulatory and reputational risk, which leans them towards doing this kind of work in the rich countries that have big media organizations and have regulatory structures, especially Europe. Whereas I think the place where there's the most human impact is probably in developing democracies. And so I think that's where we need to pressure them. And that's also something we're trying to do with the EIP is we're trying to figure out models in which we can franchise this, where when Kenya has their next set of elections, that there are local universities and NGOs who are able to get the same kind of data access and the same kind of access to operational teams that we were able to get in the United States. So I want to close with a, a going back to the the very very big picture and just say you know looking back over this election, what are your big takeaways? Like what what did we learn about this space and were there any big surprises for you? Yeah, I mean I think one big takeaway is is the importance of political influencers and their ability to set the narrative that everybody else runs with. Um, and I think that you know I've become through this experience much more, I believe much more than I used to, that the companies need to have special rules for the people that they give massive platforms to. That, you know, right now, if you have a blue check mark and a million followers, you probably are held to a lower standard on Facebook or YouTube than other people, and that needs to be inverted. If they're going to give these people a platform that is equivalent to Tucker Carlson's, for example, then it makes them as responsible for their speech as Fox is for Tucker Carlson's. I think, you know, it reinforced everything Yoche Benchler has said about the network effects here that, you know, a huge driver of this disinformation is the traditional media, political media. We saw lots of something pops up 
on online. It gets mainstreamed uh, by television or by a television host who is on social media. And then it gets recycled over and over again and then covered, you know, that that gives them the ability to quote unquote cover the controversy. So it's really interesting how you can kind of one media outlet has the ability to invent the controversy, both by pulling something out that only had a couple hundred views and then making it a big deal and then covering the fact that it's a big deal. And, you know, I, I was a little surprised at how little we saw from foreign adversaries. So I think it demonstrates that there really is a deterrence effect in the offensive operations and probably in the ability to prove that you will have hard attribution of activity. And so kind of continued cooperation of our offensive and intelligence agencies in making it difficult for these adversaries to believe they can get away with something, I think is going to be really important. All right. On that note, Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to Arbiters of Truth, the Lawfare podcast series on our online information ecosystem. You can find past episodes in the Lawfare podcast feed and in our separate Arbiters of Truth feed, and we'll be back with another episode next Thursday. The Lawfare podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brooklyn Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a material supporter at patreon.com backslash lawfare, where you'll get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. The podcast is edited by Jen Pacha Howell, and our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening. <laughs>